Welcome to Man City Fan TV Podcast. My name is Kiam and I'm your host for today's podcast. Thank you very much for tuning in, for downloading the podcast and listening and I hope you enjoy it. So today I'm going to be joined by Yannicka and Chris and I will be introducing those guys to you very shortly. But I thought as it's my first podcast, I should introduce myself. So you guys are probably wondering, who is this Kiam guy? Why is he doing a podcast? What does he know about Manchester City? So I'm going to give you a little bit of background about myself. So I'm currently uh, living in Canada. I used to live in uh, Manchester. Obviously, you can tell I'm a Mancunian from my accent. And I originally started following City back in the late 80s. So my very first game was in 1988 at Main Road. And it was Manchester City against Aston Villa. And we actually lost the game 2-0. And I remember Tony Daly scoring uh, one of the goals, I think, for for Aston Villa. Uh, So that was my very first game. And in all honesty, that got me hooked. As soon as I got into the stadium, I heard the atmosphere. I saw the Kipak stand. I was just just blown away. I absolutely loved it. And I knew that this was going to be something that I followed for the rest of my life. And that's how it turned out to be. So I was very lucky in terms of the the, the ticket availability because my friend's mum used to have some uh, spare tickets. So we used to go down Yew Tree Road. So I was originally a a sort of Fallowfield lad when I was growing up and I moved uh, towards the the Rush Home area as well. So I was always sort of in and around Fallowfield, Rush Home. And we used to sort of make our way down Yew Tree Road or Claremont Road and we'd, we'd go to the City Chippy which you guys who know Main Road back in the day will know the City Chippy was on the corner there on Claremont Road. And we'd line up, we'd have our little match day routine, we'd line up, we'd get our chips, we'd then take our chips over to the ticket office, pick up our tickets, and then we'd make our way into the main stand. And we used to sit in the main stand about halfway up, but it was quite a restricted view. You used to have the the pillars and the posts in front, so sometimes you had to stand in the aisle to get a proper view of what was going on on the pitch but it was just a fantastic experience you know for a younger lad I was I was at school back then and uh, to have that experience of, of seeing the players and experiencing the atmosphere and just the smells that you get in a football ground that smell of fresh grass and the and the you know the the camaraderie between the fans it was just absolutely fantastic I loved it and I was so thankful to my mate's mum at the time you know for getting us those tickets Obviously, as I got a little bit older, me and my mates, we decided to branch off a bit and we we made our way towards the Kipax, as most young lads of the time would do. And we used to get into the Kipax any way we could, whether it was, you know, scraping together the five pound on your paper round or taking a long run up and jumping over the turnstile or doubling up with one of your mates to get in the turnstile with just one ticket and two of years getting in or even crawling under the old turnstiles. There was that technique as well. So there was lots of different techniques to get into Main Road back in the day. And I'm sure some of the older blues probably use those techniques as well. Uh, You know who you are. You know who you are. So that was my initial sort of uh, memory of Main Road. And and, and moving into the Kipax was just a, a fantastic thing. I got to meet so many hardcore blues. The atmosphere in the old Kipax was absolutely fantastic. I used to love the games, the big games. You know, It's weird because the derbies and the Liverpool games don't really stand out to me that much. The ones I can think of are the games against Leicester, for example. Alan Kernigan, he was a centre-back for City. And he wasn't the best centre-back. You know, He was no Franco Baresi. But he managed to step forward with the ball onto the halfway line and just dink it over the keeper he, he he scored a lob from the halfway line over the keeper and I just remember seeing that from the old Kipax I remember playing Chelsea we used to have some real battles against Chelsea some real battles against Leeds and I, I witnessed all of that from from sort of the the old standing Kipax as it was back then I then later moved around the ground a little bit I you know spent a couple of games in the Platt Lane end when it eventually changed to being home supporters because originally the Platt Lane end was the away fans when I started watching because I, I sort of recall uh, the United fans in a derby being in the Platt Lane end and Cantona I think got the late late winner when they beat us 3-2 so I do remember the Platt Lane being taken up by 
away fans. But then eventually it did become home fans. And I did do the odd game in there, I think, with mates. Uh, you know, if there were spare tickets, I would go in. Or if my mate, my group of mates were going in that stand, I would go with them. But then eventually I managed to get a season ticket in the North stand. And I ended up in Block P. I think it was Block P. And this is just memory now. But it's the block that was right next to the away fans in the North stand. And I was sat towards the bottom of that stand. But as a teenage lad at the time, you just moved to the back. Everybody went to the back of the North stand. So we all stood up at the back of the North stand. You had a really thin barrier of uh, sort of mesh or tape, as you do, just between us and the away fans. And it was absolutely fantastic. The banter, the, uh, you know, the even the scuffles, I suppose, at times. It got a little bit heated uh, back then. But it was just amazing to be part of it with all your mates. You know, you're a teenage lad. The team wasn't that great. We weren't watching the best football on the pitch, but we were all behind the Blues, and it was absolutely fantastic. I even remember 10 or 12 rows in front. I think Natalie Pike sat there as well. And as a group of young lads, we were all very interested in Natalie Pike at the time. You know, uh, we, we, we didn't have the courage to go and speak to her, but I just have memories of Natalie Pike being in and around that area as well. So if anybody tells you Natalie's not a proper Blue, it's a lie because she was there. Natalie is a proper, proper blue. Uh, so I won't hear a bad word on social media. I'll always defend Natalie if anybody accuses her of not being a proper blue. And I also remember Helen the Bell. This is a memory that stays with me because Helen was a very famous City fan. If you don't know who she is, she was an elderly lady at the time. and She used to ring the bell at Main Road. And I was very lucky because there was one occasion where I ended up sat on the front row of the North Stand and Helen was sat next to me. And she just started talking to me. I was only a teenage lad. And she started telling me these stories about Manchester City playing away in Europe and how Manchester City played against the likes of Juventus and how she couldn't use the, the ladies' toilets in Italy because they didn't have them in the stadium. So she had to use the men's toilets and... All these little snippets of information. And I was sat there thinking, Manchester City playing against Juventus and playing against these world-renowned teams in Europe. I just, I could not even imagine it happening. It just was something so far away from where we were at the time. But that conversation, and I thank Helen for this from the bottom of my heart, but that conversation filled me with a sense of pride and it filled me with the courage to sort of carry on supporting City even though the times went really really dark and we moved you know down the leagues obviously we were relegated and I was there against Liverpool when Steve Lomas was holding the ball in the corner for a two-all draw and uh, we actually needed to win the game and we you know we, we made a mess of it and we ended up getting relegated obviously we then went down against uh, Stoke as well we went further down the league so I was there through all of that but those words that Helen sort of gave to me just made me believe it gave me hope that Manchester City were going to become a force they had everything they needed to become a force they, they had been a force in the past and we could get there again and yes it would need a little bit of investment and it would need uh, you know time but we could get there and then obviously eventually we got promoted I was there at Wembley when we got promoted against Gillingham Paul Dickoff scoring and we managed to to get a fantastic deal on the Etihad Stadium. We moved into the Etihad. I renewed my season ticket. I was in the South Stand at the Etihad. And obviously the rest is history. We, we got taken over in, in 2008. And we started to become the global powerhouse that we are today. So I'm very, very lucky that I saw the whole journey. I was there when Aguero scored that goal. I was there when we beat Liverpool in the, in the cup final. So... Lots of great, great memories that stay with me. I'm now in Canada. I don't get to many games. If I come back at Christmas, I will get to the games. Like this year, I think it's South, not Southampton, Sheffield United. And I, I'll be there. I'll be there over Christmas. But I don't get to many. So I, I do miss going to the games. I miss that atmosphere. But I feel very, very privileged that I managed to share so many memories with my loved ones and with my friends at Main Road, at the Etihad and I feel like Manchester City really is in my blood so a huge thank you to Andy for allowing me to uh, take part in 
this podcast and, and host the podcast. And obviously, a big thank you to Andy Full Stop because he started Man City Fan TV. He decided that he wanted to create a channel for the fans, by the fans. And it's a hell of a lot of work for somebody who's working, for somebody who, you know, runs his own business. To actually do something like that is a fantastic gesture from a Man City fan. And for a fan like me who was away living in another country, it was it was it was a link. It was a link back home to Manchester City. It was a community for me to engage with again. And I'm really, really thankful that I can, uh, you know, continue to do that with this podcast and obviously with the Man City fan TV channel and content. Without further ado, what we'll do then is we will we will move on, and I'm going to introduce the guests that I have on the show today. And we are joined by the lovely Yannicka and the wonderful Chris. And uh, let's go ahead and have a chat with them. I'm joined today by uh, Chris and Yannicka. So please uh, introduce yourself, uh, Yannicka. Hi, I'm Yannicka. Um, I've been a City fan my whole life, really, but I didn't start going till about 2005. And then ever since, I've had a season ticket pretty much. So, yeah, go to most games, every home game, and I try to get to some away games, but I only do about three to four a season at the moment. And then every Wembley fixture. <laughs> Wonderful. And uh, where where are you currently located, Yannicka? Um, I live in South London at the moment, nice. but I did move back to Manchester because that's where all my family lives. So I'm just kind of back and forth at the moment. Okay. Wonderful. What about yourself, Chris? Uh, introduce yourself uh, to the uh, listeners. Hi, Kiam. Hi, Yannicka. Hi, everyone else that's listening. Uh, my name's Chris. I've been on the show a couple of times and various things. Uh, been a City fan all my life. First time I went was in 76. Uh, unfortunately, not a season ticket holder because of my job. I have to work every other weekend, so I go as often as I can, basically. But, uh, yeah, spot a City all my life, mate. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you uh, both for, for joining me today. This is my first podcast, and uh, I I sought you guys out because I've seen you on uh, on social media Yannicka, and I've always been impressed with your opinions, and uh, I thought you'd be a, a fantastic guest to have on the very first podcast. And Chris, obviously, we know each other a little bit through Man City Fan TV, so thank you, uh, thank you both for joining me on this very first podcast. So, where we're going to start then, obviously, is with yesterday's game at Selhurst Park. So, I know you were there, Yannicka, so you're going to have the the sort of pitch side view of the game. Yeah. So I'm just going to start with the the sort of opening half an hour or so in that game. I I found City huffed and puffed a little bit in that first half an hour. How how did you find it? Um, I think the issue for us at the moment is we're not as clinical as we need to be, and I think like if you look at the statistics from yesterday, we had ten shots on target. And we scored two. And the thing is, that's fine because we won 2 0. But I just think they also had two shots on target. So if Edison didn't make the saves that he made, that game could have ended 2 2, pretty much because we weren't finishing chances that really and truly we should be finishing. Um, so I think that's a bit of an issue for us at the moment. I feel like we scored eight in one game. And then after that, we've kind of struggled a little bit. Um, and what would be the reason in? Behind that, uh, you know, lack of cutting edge at the moment. Do you think there's anything uh, specific that's uh, causing the issue? Um, I'm not sure, really. I think Sterling's kind of been, he was on fire at the start of the season. And then he's kind of going through a little bit of a, I don't even want to say a dry patch because he still gets goals. But I think he's just not as clinical as he was maybe at the beginning. Um, And then everyone else, it's kind of like, Sometimes we try and walk it in 
and it's a bit like some days you need to kind of just shoot from outside the box and we don't tend to do that um yeah we did we, we did should. create a lot of chances yesterday didn't we yeah. and, and they, were, they, were, they were sort of half chances i think yeah. in the first half there was a, a quite a few crosses coming in from the right hand side and they were yeah. either just a little bit too high or not quite accurate enough and then when we did manage to get something on the ball it, it, it tended to be sort of a half finish and a scuff or the keeper yeah. you know didn't have that much work to do so Sterling can you see signs of Sterling creeping back to the old Sterling the Sterling that was there when Guardiola first arrived or do you think it's just a little bit of a, a minor blip at the moment um I'd say it's just a minor because he's he's improved a hell of a lot and he's still scoring for England do you know what I mean so I think I think it's just the squad at the moment and with the injuries we've had, it's kind of knocked them a little bit because even though it's not necessarily a striker that's injured, apart from Sade, obviously, um, like it's not a forward player that's injured. I think it still affects everyone when they don't have Laporte to kind of rely on. Um, so I think ever since Laporte got injured, the team's looked a little bit more vulnerable. Um, and obviously we've not been putting the ball in the net as much as we probably should. But yeah. as long as we get the win, like yesterday, we scored two goals, two goals was enough. And we defended quite well yesterday, so it didn't matter too much. But I just think, you know, we can't really be having 10 shots on target and scoring two goals out of the oh, 10. And what, what was the feeling in the stadium, Yannick? Was there quite a bit of uh, nervous sort of tension around in the first half an hour? Um, well, before I even went to the game, I actually asked, um, on Twitter is anyone confident and a lot of people were saying no no not at all you know because Palace is not the easiest place to go even though we do get results there um, usually um, it isn't the easiest place to go you know Zaha gets a goal and then you're on the back foot so um, yeah the, the crowd feel, are pretty close to the pitch aren't they so it, yeah if the crowd get up it can be a really difficult yeah. place and they do have a good atmosphere as well um, but I think yesterday, I think once we were in the stadium, we saw how City were playing. I wasn't really concerned that we weren't going to win the game. I think we, we were doing enough that made us look like we were going to win. And then when we got the two goals, that kind of just sealed it. Um, they did get back into the game, but by the time they got back in, it was already kind of too late. So I think even if we did concede, I think we would have seen the game out yesterday. Yeah, um, yeah. But it, was quite, it was quite a good performance, I thought. And and how did you see it, Chris? Were, were you were you of similar thinking there? Do you think uh, we were a little bit wasteful in that first half, first sort of half an hour? Uh, not in the first half an hour, I didn't think. So I think uh, towards the end of the game, we were. I totally agree with you. I thought for, I thought we started off really well. Uh, the energy level seemed to be up again, uh, and I think uh, Mendy, although I don't think he had a great game, he did all right. I thought Cancelo had a good game. Uh, they seemed to give us a few more options. Uh, I think Gundogan had a shot, didn't he? That got deflected on about 20 minutes, where you know uh, Hennessy did a good thing, but it looked like a li- it felt a little bit like the Wolves game. But I was watching it on telly, so it's hard to te- you know tell that you thought, "Where's the goal coming from?" Uh, um, thankfully, yeah. it did. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're going to upset Andy there by saying Cancelo had a good game because Andy was uh, a little bit critical yesterday of Cancelo. I was getting messages. Yeah. So yeah, I thought he did okay. Well, I rewatched it again this afternoon, and I couldn't really see what Andy was on about. If I'm honest with you, I thought he had a he had a really decent game. He didn't he didn't make any mistakes. He got a good tackle in at one point when um, I think it was Ferner uh, left Rodri short with a a pass. I think it was, and and he, and Cancelo yeah. made a really good tackle. You know, really strong tackle. So. Um, no, I thought yeah, I thought Cancelo played well, and I think he didn't make those sort of bursting runs that Walker makes, but he he was always available and played some, some you know sensible passes. Uh, and I thought I thought first half an hour I thought we looked better, but I, I was a bit concerned. I think I was a bit nervous about yesterday's game as well. So uh, yeah, I mean the, the only moment that springs to mind with Cancelo for me was uh, when the ball went through in the first half. And I think the Crystal Palace player was offside and Cancelo sort of chested it right into the path of the, the Crystal Palace player and the, and the player was in, basically. Yeah. But luckily for us, the linesman's flag went up. Oh, that was the only sort of error that I saw. 
everything else was was pretty steady. And for a guy who's played what three or four games, I think you know he does yeah. need a little bit of time to bed in. And I don't think he's doing that much wrong. And uh, second half, I think he was fantastic. I think he absolutely yeah. nailed uh, Zaha on occasions and kept him out of the game. So, yeah, I agree. Absolutely agree. I think, uh, like you said, the right hand side in the first half an hour. Were, there was good balls put in by uh, Kevin, him and Bernardo. It was just no one got on the end of them, you know. There was, yeah. there was about five or six good crosses in. Yeah. What What are your thoughts on uh, Cancelo, Yannicka? Um, I really like him so far. I think he is new to our squad. And I think a lot of people need to remember, even Bernardo Silva, his first season was a bit shaky. Mares, his first season was a bit shaky. I'd say it's only really Rodri that's come in and hit the ground running. I think everyone else took a little bit of time to kind of, maybe not too long, maybe one game or two. But I think, you know, he's he, he looks good to me. Um, okay. And I think when he settles in, I think he'll be, he'll be very good. But I yeah. think, yeah, he needs a bit of time, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned Rodri there, so that, that moves us on to the sort of makeshift <laughs> defence that, had us all sort of questioning what was going on before the game. We saw the team sheet, and I think everybody uh, was coming up with new formations: one, three, <laughs> two, one, eight, one, six. I don't, I don't know what kind of formations we all had in our heads, but it ended up uh, being a four-four. Well, a four-three-three three, was it? I think it was. Yeah, four-three-three. Three. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you had Ferner and Rodri at centre back. How how do you think that pairing uh, managed to to deal with the game, Yannicka? Um, well, I thought they did quite well, considering. Um, it's funny, actually, because my friend, who's a United fan, he messaged me saying, you're playing no centre-backs. And I made a joke saying, well, to be honest, Fernandinho is probably better than the centre-backs that we have available. Um, yeah. And I do think he is very good in that position. And would I swap him for Amendi? Probably not. Not that I've got anything against that Amendi. I quite like him, but I think, in terms of form at the moment, Fernandinho has to start at centre-back. Um, and then Rodri is just, he's so calm. He's kind of like, a bit like a, you know, Vincent Company was always quite calm at the back. And I feel like he's like that in general. So I wouldn't be panicking too much if someone's running at Rodri. I've been asking for Rodri at centre-back for a couple of weeks yeah. now, because I think that his height is just yeah. a, a more sensible yeah. option. But I expected Rodri to go back to centre-back and then Fernandinho to go to his normal position because I think we've missed Fernandinho's speed yeah. when it when yeah. it comes to actually uh, transferring the ball and recycling it and getting it forward. I think we've missed that that sort of a speed of pass in the middle. Not that Rodri isn't a good player. I think he's no. going to get there. It's going to take time. Uh, what did you think of the uh, the, the centre-back pairing, Chris? It's going to sound boring now, but yeah, I totally agree with what you just said there, uh, Kiyama. You know, I thought they did really. That's the first time they've ever played together, you know, in that position. Uh, I don't think we could have asked for much more than what they did. I think a couple, a couple of chances chances there where they didn't pass the ball great, but but didn't lead to anything, thank, uh, thankfully. Um, I thought they did really well, and don't mind if that's the uh, back four until Stones is fully ready and, you know, Laporte's back because uh, I'm not an Otamendi fan. Yeah, I mean, I think Otamendi, and this sounds harsh, but I think he's served his purpose now for the club. And that sounds really brutal for a player that's won titles with us. But he he does seem to be losing a yard of pace. He's erratic at times. He's always been a bit like that. But when you lose the yard of pace and you're still erratic, then that yeah. becomes quite a toxic sort of combination as we saw at you know Norwich for example uh, the only thing I would say is with Fernandinho playing at centre back do you not think we're missing missing him in his regular position what, what are your thoughts on that do you think Rodri can fill that position or or does he need a bit more time uh, I think Rodri will fill that position but I, I would agree with you that Fernandinho is the man in that position. I can't think of anybody in world football who I'd rather play in that position. If everyone is available then, John Stones, well, not everyone, uh, you know, the players that we've currently got. So John Stones is back. 
Yeah. Would you start John Stones with Fernandinho, or would you would you bring Otamendi in? Would you play Ferner in his holding position? What would be your sort of triangle there, if you like, the centre backs and the holding midfielder? Oh, see, for me, Fernandinho, like you say, is the best possible option for that position. Um, because with Fernandinho, I think his main thing is actually cutting out an attack. So you know, if someone's running at him. He'll just put a tackle in, win the ball, and it gives our other players a chance to get back. You know, people like Mendy that might be down the wing or yep. Walker or whatever. So I think he is important. But since he has been in centre-back, he has played well. I think with John Stones, um, I don't have an issue with John Stones, but I think together his and Mendy's record is not great. So I don't know whether it's just when they play together or whether it's the individuals that aren't kind of doing their job in them matches or what, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I think them two together don't work. So either John Stones comes in with Fernandinho or even Rodri, because he didn't do too badly, um, or Otamendi would come in with one of them. But I, I don't know whether Otamendi and John Stones Yeah, I mean, we've definitely together. seen Otamendi and Stones struggle, in the, especially in the big yeah. games. You know, Anfield yeah. comes to mind, doesn't it, when you think of that yeah. centre-back pairing and how much they struggled there. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Mendy on the, you know, on the on the left-hand side there. Yeah. I thought he had a fantastic game yesterday. Personally, uh, what 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 do you think of his performance, Janica? Um, I love Mendy to be honest, because <laughs> I think he just offers so much going forward. Um, and then he is he's got the speed to get back as well. So it's not like you know he's he's, he's leaving people. Yeah, physically he looked a little bit uh, out of out of shape. I mean, I won't say out of shape because if he looks at me, I can't really claim Benjamin Mendy's out of shape. Uh, yeah. But he just looked a little bit a yard off the pace, you know, from match fitness yeah. uh, to me. He, he looked like he was carrying a little bit of bulk as well. So hopefully he can, you know, keep that injury away and lose a few pounds there, just you know, tone up a bit, and he'll be the, the left back we know he can be. Uh, what, what do you think of Mendy, Chris? Uh, from yesterday, I thought he had he had a decent game yesterday. Uh, I, what I feel with him when when Palace really were quite negative yesterday, and um, he, when he's running on the ball or counter attacking, he's so dangerous. When when we're actually you know on the counter, when we are on the on the front foot, I think his crosses were disappointing yesterday. Uh, and they, uh, I'd rather he was crossing from a deeper position than f- from the byline. But I think he's a great. I think he's a, a good player. He needs games. He's had two seasons out, really. Um, I just hope he can come back because I think he is a decent player. You know, and he's at Monaco. He's sensational. Yeah, he seems to like to get to the byline, doesn't he? And fire the shot, though, the cross, sorry, with just a crazy amount of pace on it. Yeah. Whereas if he did cross from a little bit deeper and added a bit of whip to it, it would probably be a bit more dangerous. Uh, so maybe that's something he'll adapt. I prefer it? having him at left-back than uh, Zinchenko. And I don't want to disrespect Zinchenko at all because uh, last season he did a great job. And, but it reminds mm. me a bit of Delft the season before that. It, you know, he had a great season at left-back and then struggled when he when he came back. And I just think Zinchenko, when he plays the simple passes, you know, he, you know he's all right. But when he tries to be a bit more flamboyant, I think he gives a ball away too much. Uh, and I think, you know, in Pep's system, that's not a good thing. Yeah, definitely. So the first goal then came on 39 minutes. It was a cross from Bernardo Silva. And it was uh, Gabby Jesus with the finish. So what did you make of Gabby Jesus? I mean, he, got, he obviously got the goal there. Uh, do you think he had a good game, Yannicka? Do you think he stepped into Aguero's shoes and uh, did the business? Yeah, I think that header was a good header, to be honest. Um, I think he has done well for us. It's just, with every player, they need kind of a run of games. If they get injured, they need a few games to get back to their fitness level. Um, and I feel like at City, because of the players we have, they don't. he doesn't necessarily get that chance to have five games in a row where he can build on you know, what he's doing. Whereas someone like Sterling, they might get that five games. He wouldn't necessarily because of Aguero. Um, but I think every time he comes in, he's always involved in goals. You know what I mean? Whether he scores or not, 
He's still yeah. involved. He's very good at off the ball. Like he's probably one of our best players off the ball mm. in terms of dragging people wide and whatever. Um, yeah, I think he did well yesterday. He's been injured a few times at Palace as well, so I think he was being a bit cautious at, at some stages. Yeah, that that's a good point. Left, actually, I think he was a bit scared. Yeah, that's a very good point. He was injured, wasn't he, at Crystal yeah, Palace? So twice. it probably was in his mind. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of uh, Gab- uh, Gabriel Jesus, Chris? Are you, are you a fan of, of Gabby? Uh, I thought yesterday, I, th- I thought he had a great game. I thought he was he was everywhere, uh, took his goal well. Uh, he, he had one bad point, didn't he, when he didn't cross over to KDB. He really should have slid that across to him. But, yeah, um, so we were all screaming at him to pass yeah. the ball, pass the ball, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's that's the only thing I can knock him for yesterday because I thought he was everywhere. I thought he, was, he played really well. Uh, um, and I totally agree with Yannicka. He needs a run of games, but he's never going to get that with Sergio still there. Uh, I, and I think, he, you know, he could be Sergio's replacement. Yeah, I yeah, tend I, to agree. I mean, I, I find that with Gabby Jesus, you just get bundles and bundles of energy. And what he does is, with the likes of Sterling and Bernardo sort of buzzing around him and KDB when he's fit, you, you end up with this uh, just this ball of energy all around the, the pitch. And, it, and it's so hard for defences to cope with that kind of movement. And even if sometimes it, the quality isn't quite there like Aguero, yeah. he's still going to occupy the defences and, and cause so many problems. So I, I think he gets a little bit of a hard time from City fans. And, and I think the guy will come good. And, yeah. be, and be our star man in all honesty if he gets the opportunities he's that's... still very young isn't he still very young yeah yeah still young you know obviously Brazil rate him very highly and if you're playing for Brazil at the age he is then you know you've got to be half decent so I think he does need a little bit of time and I think the City fans need to be patient so then it's the second goal then came from David Silva and it was only what two minutes later so we, we were all celebrating that first goal and uh, you probably not even finished celebrating in the second goal game. <laughs> uh, what was it like in the in the stadium when that second goal went in, Yannicka? Uh, it's just like, I think everyone was just a bit relieved because at the moment with City, we've kind of, there's been a few games where we've scored, but not won. So I think when we got the second, it was confirmation, really. Um, but I think with it being David, you know, he has a lot of love from City fans. I know people do slate him on Twitter and stuff, but I don't really find that in the stadium. You know, I don't, I don't find that kind of... Everyone seems to love him, you know, so... Yeah. yeah, I think people are happy. Obviously, it was a great ball from Sterling, you know, so... It was. It yeah, was a fantastic goal. pass. Yeah. Fantastic pass by a little scoop over the top. Yeah. And uh, David Silva got it. What do you think of KDB's contribution to that goal, though? He... Well, he sort of brought it out, didn't he, from the back? Yeah, I think, you know what, he's actually been slated a little bit, not by City fans, obviously, but by, I think it's United fans on Twitter. Um, and they were saying that he didn't have any assists, any goal contributions or whatever, but it's like, he's just come back from injury. I thought he did all right. Um, Are these the United fans that rate Paul Pogba by any well, chance? Well, <laughs> probably, you know. But okay. I think he, for him to be on his first game back, I think he did all right. We didn't see the De Bruyne that we have seen earlier in the season, you know, before he got injured. Yeah. Um, but I think he still did all right and he didn't do anything wrong. There was no pass that, you know, he gave the ball away and then they scored or anything like that. So yeah. I think he did quite well. I Maybe. had De Bruyne down as my my man of the match, to be honest, yeah. just because of the contributions and, and yeah. just because of that quality. You could see he stood out above all of the other players on the pitch. He was yeah. the main man, the best player there. I mean, What do you think of uh, KDB's performance, Chris? I thought he had a good game. I uh, agree. Again, with Yannicka, you know, he wasn't on his top game, but uh, he, he was always around the pitch. He you know, gets his foot in. Uh, he sees passes. I mean, he didn't play any of his world. He passes yesterday. I think the cross that um, eluded everybody was a, you know, just those crosses just been a nightmare to defend. I don't know how you're supposed to. It's just a pity Gabby couldn't get on the end of it. Um, for that goal, I think Rodri broke up a, a Palace attack, didn't he? And passed it out to um, Silva. Made a really quick pass to KDB, which sent him on his way. Um, brilliant from Sterling and uh, you know 
uh, textbook volley from Silver, a brilliant, brilliant goal. Yeah, there's, there's no better sight, is there? When City break like that with the power and yeah. pace, when De Bruyne's in there in the middle and you, we're just we're just unstoppable when we break like that. Really, really impressive goal. And I think that pretty much settled all the nerves for the City fans. Once that goal went in, yeah. I was like, this one's in the bag now. How many are we going to get? And then the start of the second half, I think we we came out a little bit wobbly for sort of five or ten minutes. And I was like, uh-oh. Here we go. Are we going to concede a goal? How how did you feel just after half time, uh, Yannick? Did, did you think we were going to let one in? Uh, um, yeah. I, I, with City at the moment, you can't guarantee a clean sheet. We're not that. Um, you know, we can be a bit unpredictable. But for some reason, Edison loves Salhurst Park because every time he goes there, he is sensational. He saved that penalty two seasons ago. You know, in the dying seconds, I thought he's never going to save it, and he did. So, yeah, I think I think Edison had a fantastic game, and that is, you know, part of the reason why we didn't concede as well. Yeah, I thought both um, goalkeepers were actually, were actually fantastic yeah. for both teams. Yeah, Hennessy was really good. Edison just amazing some of those saves yeah. that he pulled off. In terms of uh, how the the second half sort of progressed, then it it, it started to get a little bit frustrating. Uh, we were missing quite a few chances. I, I, I note Sterling, I, I had him written down on my little notepad. He, he missed like three or four pretty yeah. decent chances. Was was that frustrating for you, Chris? Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, I, I didn't think they were going to score at the start of the second half. I, I felt we were kind of, I think we slowed the tempo of our, our play down. I think with the 2-0 lead, I think, you know, we, we wanted to bring them out of their shells. But, but And although Palace were a bit more positive... It wasn't really till the last sort of ten minutes when, you know, when um, Edison was needed. Uh, I thought I thought we, as I say, Sterling. It was frustrating. It was like watching you play him in FIFA, um, Kim. But hey, don't, uh, don't you be shouting at my FIFA? <laughs> hey, my FIFA is 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 legendary. No, it's not. It's like legendary in my in my house. That's about it. <laughs> um, but I thought, uh, yeah, if you had his shooting boots on yesterday, Sterling would have been a ten. Because he was, yeah. he, his work rate was fantastic. You know that that's a saving tackle that he made, um, and yeah. Rodri slipped. He he was he was his work rate. You cannot fault him for it. If he just had, had his shooting boots on, mate, that would have been a perfect performance from him. Yeah, no, I, I mean I do agree. Sterling has come on so far under Pep that yeah. the guy is always going to have a little bit of a dip. It's, it's going to happen, and and. I think Sterling has actually suffered the most from the team being unsettled with the injuries. With us yeah. missing Laporte and having that balance and, and Sterling's had to sort of shift from left to right at times and sometimes yeah. he's had to play, you know, more centrally when when, when it's been needed. And I, I just find that with Sterling he, he needs to have that settled team with KD being behind and David Silva, so he's got that service. And then he's fine. Uh, you know, he's finishing, yeah. You know, you could say he was a little bit wasteful. But at the end of the day, away from home, you are under pressure sometimes. You know, you, you do snap at shots a little bit. So it wasn't it wasn't the end of the world. And, and we had the two goals already in the bag. So we're going to move on to what we all knew we were going to talk about, let's be honest. <laughs> and it is those three letters, V-A-R. And honestly... <laughs> I, I didn't want to mention it at all because I'm sick of hearing about it. But 60 minutes into the game, KDB runs through on goal. Zaha, well, I'm not going to say brings him down because I don't want to influence your answers, but the VAR reviewed it and said no penalty. What What are your thoughts on that, Yannicka? Um, Well, obviously in the stadium, it looked like a penalty. Um. But I knew the minute they said it was being reviewed, I knew we weren't going to get it. Because my take on VAR is the referee makes the decision. The VAR people are not necessarily wanting to overturn it. So I think unless it's really obvious, and even when it is really obvious, I think half the time they just agree with the referee. So if the referee had given it and it got reviewed, they would have given it. You know, I think it's, they're more in agreement with the ref than actually looking at what's happened. I think it's. I think yeah. we're gonna we're gonna get robbed quite a lot if if 
we're relying on VAR, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it's apparently, I was listening to uh, Dermot Gallagher on the TV today, yeah. and he said it's for clear and obvious errors. Yeah. So that's where it comes in. So if, if the referee yeah. has made a clear error, so let's just say, for example, yeah. you know, somebody ham, handballs or, or he, he gives a handball, and it's clearly not handball, then they will step in for, for those. But if yeah. it's the referee's interpretation of whether it was a foul or not, then VAR will just leave it, which yeah. I find a little strange because it's sort of like, well, what's the purpose of having VAR if we're going to end up with the wrong decision at the end of it? Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's a strange one. What, what do you think, uh, Chris? I think VAR, I'm allowed to swear. I won't swear. Uh, I, think, I think it's absolutely, I don't know, I just... Just rubbish, mate. I mean, I watched the rugby this morning and uh, the uh, French player got sent off against Wales and the referee didn't spot it. It was an obvious red card uh, and they played it back on the big screen. You could hear the referee talking to the uh, the, the guy in the box. and you could, It's all clear. You know exactly what's going on because if that wasn't a penalty yesterday, then nothing is. He, he, sh he shoved him to the floor, you know. He's running angle where the ball was going. Uh, if that it was a clear and obvious mistake by the referee, and and still they didn't want to embarrass the referee by saying no, you got it wrong, mate. Yeah. yeah. Did you did you, did you have the same feeling as Yannicka that you knew it wasn't going to be given? I think. Did you, did you see De Bruyne's face straight after when they said you know you know a goal kick? Even he could see you know we're never getting anything. <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 Pep looked really frustrated, and I think in his press conference after the match. They asked him about it, and they said, he, "You know, you're frustrated." He, he said, "You know, of course he is." And and then he mentioned every week it's a dive, dive, dive. He says, and yeah. Tottenham, yeah. it was a clear handball. So he yeah. was having a bit of a dig there, you know, at the VAR and at, at the at the media I think as well. Because and it wasn't the only decision yesterday. You know, throughout the games with VAR, just you just think, what, what's it there for? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, at the moment, and this is how it feels, and I know I'm biased, and, and this is why you have to be careful. When, when you've got your blue tinted glasses on, you are going to look at things a certain way. And it feels as if there is a tool there now that they can use to, to pretty much dictate the result of a game. Yeah. And whether or not that is being corrupted or used by, you know, people that, I don't know. I mean, that's that's just speculation, and you know, I can't accuse anybody of doing that. But it does have a feel that City are getting a little bit sort of stitched up when it comes to to the VAR decisions. Uh, but you know, I can't I can't prove that or say for certain. It could just be we're having the you know we're getting the the, the not not getting the rubber the green at the moment. So it could uh, it could turn. And later on in the season, we could be getting the decision. So, we will see. But I'm not going to hold my breath on that it's, one. It's uh, the inconsistency, I think, that's just it's blowing my mind. It's, uh, Deli Ali's uh, equaliser yesterday for Spurs. Mm. Clearly hit his arm. Uh, and it, it led to a goal. Uh, today, Mane's brushed, he brushed his arm. And he's got disallowed. Yeah, the one with Rodri where, you know, it brushed his arm and it led to a goal and was disallowed. There's just no consistency with it. One of the things I wanted to mention then when it comes to uh, City's performance, and, and, and to be honest, just the way City have been playing recently, I find that we've got this air of uh, uncertainty about us at the moment. I, I think we can be rattled very easily. And I just wanted your thoughts on that. It looks like as soon as a game sort of goes past the 20-minute mark. If we haven't scored, the players can get a little bit nervy, a little bit edgy. I also find that the mistakes start to creep in, just sloppy little moments. Like yesterday, the City players seem to want to play the ball back quite a lot. I don't know if you noticed that, but I found that Gundogan uh, was playing backwards a lot at the beginning of the game. Do you, do you think this is just a confidence thing at the moment because of the re results that we've had, Chris? I'm going to disagree with you there on Gundogan. I've, I thought Gundogan uh, had his head up and played a lot of balls for the clock. Oh, he had a great game. Uh, so that's just on that. But I do agree with you if we because we have scored a lot of in a lot of games early on, and it, and we seem that seems to make us settle. And I thought yesterday we started at a good pace. You know, we're getting some really dangerous balls in the box. 
but nothing went in. And then from from probably about 15 minutes to when we scored, it felt like, you know, is it ever going to come, you know? And I think it is a confidence thing with football. is a massive, massive thing with football. You know, confidence is it, in any sport, actually, you know, has a huge effect. So do you think, think the confidence it, probably is a result of... of- the injuries and just the you know the, the the changing and tinkering with the team that Pep's had to do because of the injuries. Uh, maybe that maybe that is partly to do. With it. I think I think Laporte is a massive injury. You know, I think he's you know I, I mean I'm missing Sane, but Laporte is a massive concern. I think I think the team know that the you know we aren't as solid at the, at the back and we need to score goals to ensure we win games. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I found, uh, Chris. I found at the beginning of the game, Gundogan was pretty negative. And I'm not just singling Gundogan out because he, he wasn't the only one. I found even, you know, Cancelo and Mendy at times, they would just cut back inside and they'd go for that easy ball back to the centre-back. Yeah. And it just looked like, I don't know, there was just a little bit of belief lacking. As soon as we got the goal, that all changed. And, and I agree with you. I think Gundogan then went on to have a fantastic game and was, you know, and was playing forward passes and was looking for a forward pass all the time. But it was just something I noticed at the beginning. And I don't know whether it was just because it was an away game and we've had a bit of uh, bad luck in away games recently. Um, I mean, sorry, maybe the, the reason that we didn't play many risky passes yesterday, or, you know, was was because of the uh, the back line, you know. Maybe it was like, keep it more simple and work it try and work it that way rather than go for something spectacular or flamboyant you know try and get the team to settle because to have that defensive pairing at the back you know that's got to go through the whole team you know that that they're not our regular center backs they're not regular center backs anyway let's just try and control the game so maybe that's why it went back a bit more than you wanted us to and now let's get Yannicka's opinion, because Yannicka, you were at the game, so you're going to have a, a better view of it than, than myself and Chris. What 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 did you see? Did you see that lack of confidence that I'm talking about at the beginning of the game? And uh, do you think there is an issue there with confidence at the moment? I, I just feel like because of the previous results we've had, they're obviously under a lot of pressure. Um, because I think if we'd have won every game like Liverpool, they would have probably gone into that game a bit more relaxed. They wouldn't have been too concerned if they didn't score straight away and whatever. But I think the games that we were winning at the start of the season, we were scoring early. And then the games where we struggled to score early were the ones that we kind of were dropping points in. So I think it does kind of, if they don't score within the first sort of 20 minutes, I think they do start panicking. Oh my God, is it going to be one of these games again where we don't win? Um, so I think when we got the goal yesterday was really important because it was before half time. I think if we'd have gone in at half time nil nil, I feel like the confidence would have would have decreased even more, and I think we might have even struggled to get the goal. Um, but I think yeah, I just think it's at the moment. I think it's because of our previous results, um, and obviously the injuries that we've got. It is Laporte who is our main defender. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it is, yeah. They're not going to be as confident, you know, in general, knowing that they've not got Laporte, you know, or company or whoever, you know. Mm. So, so would you, would you have would you have bought a centre back in the summer, Yannicka? I feel like the biggest miss to company is not even him as a player. I think it's what he did in the changing room, which is um, which is a, the biggest loss for us because company was injury prone, so we didn't have him all season. But what we did have is he usually did come back in a title race and just push us on a little bit. Um, so I feel like if we do get to the end of the season and we're still chasing, we don't have company to kind of push us along a little bit, which is a bit of a shame. So mm. I, think I, I, think I think that's a great point. That's a great yeah. point. Yeah, because, I mean, if you think about the all or nothing documentary, yeah, you know, company that in the, the changing room and also, and this is a player that, will probably sound a bit strange because he's not the greatest player, but Delph, he was yeah. a big talker in the changing rooms. He was quite a senior figure and Delph's gone as well. Uh, so, th- th- you know, there is a, a lack of uh, talking, I'd imagine, behind the scenes compared to what there was last season. 
Uh, so maybe that's having an effect. What, what do you think about that, Chris? I, I think that not buying a centre half in the summer it, it was City taking half the ball. I think it, I think it's unbelievable that we've allowed that to happen. And I, I do agree that you know that companies are more than just a, a, than the, than the footballer. He, you know, he he was Mister Manchester City, wasn't he? But um, I can't believe we didn't buy a centre half. I think it's I think it really poor from the people above. You know, or it, or Pep whoever decided that we just go. This season with with what we've got, I think it was a poor decision. Yeah, um, I t- totally agree with you about Delph. You know, he, he did come across on that documentary as a, a you know, a, a, like a captain, really, didn't he? You know, he, he, yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah, you know, he, he gave that rant, didn't he? What was that rant about going back to basics? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think like that, you know, I mean, as much as we all love David Silver, you can't imagine David ever being that sort of person, can you? No, no, definitely not. I mean, I don't know. I think with uh, with with City at the moment, you know, the the question marks are there because of the the, the new players that have come in. Obviously, Rodri, you've got Cancelo. So, are these players gonna come in and need a, a lot of time to adjust? Is it going to be a two year sort of period before these guys come in and and then become a voice in the changing rooms and uh, and, and and contribute in that way? But when you think about somebody like Cancelo, Andy has been critical of Cancelo, as I mentioned earlier on. And I can see where the frustration comes because Andy wanted a centre-back and he wanted somebody to come in and replace Vincent Company for, for the reasons we've just stated. So to then go out and spend $45 million or whatever he spent on Cancelo, I think that was a, a strange buy, even though I don't think the lad's doing a bad job. Uh, so, yeah, I, I get what you're saying, Chris. I mean, I, 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 think... I think it's a strange buy because Danilo wanted to go, didn't he? So we had to replace Danilo. And uh, and what was the strange bit with it? We spent that much money on Cancelo and gave Walker a five-year extension. or I think it was a five-year. We gave an extension to his contract. So you've got two people there who probably both expect to be the first-choice right-back. And are going to be mifted for not. So I don't know if that's going to be a problem. I don't know. You know, don't know enough about Cancelo's character. I mean, Walker seems like a, a decent lad, but um, yeah, I, I'm I'm with Andy totally on that. We we should have bought a centre half, and I think it's pretty poor that we never really. Yeah, I I, I, I agree with Andy on that. I think I think we should have gone for a centre back, and I, and I can understand Andy's frustration. In- I don't like to, I don't like to slag off City because because the, the way we are run these days is. A million times better than it ever was, but I just think we did take our eye off the ball there. Yeah, no, I agree. I definitely agree. And and you know we we saw it in the documentary uh, last year when they were going for Van Dyke and and they backed away. But to be fair, they backed away and got Laporte. So yeah, you've got you know you've got to say they are th- they are a thinking club. There's a lot of thought goes into our signings. We don't just yeah. go out there and throw money at it. So and I agree that Maguire was too much money to pay for. You know. Yeah. I think he would have been a decent signing if we got him at 35, 40 million, but he's not 85 million or whatever United pays for him. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think that's the issue with it, though. I think it's not that we didn't want to sign a, a centre back. I think it's just who we went. I think with City, we kind of get our minds set on someone, and that's who we want. And then when we don't get that person, or when the price goes too high, we back out, which I think is a good thing, you know. Um, in hindsight, really, if we hadn't have backed out and got Van Dijk, Liverpool probably wouldn't be where they are, you mm. know, which is which would be a good thing. But I think I do respect the club that they did say, you know what, we're not going to pay that, and they didn't, you know. So I think the same's happened with Maguire, and then I think it was too late then to look at someone else. So I think Pep just thought, you know what, we'll deal with what we have, and unfortunately. Laporte get injured because I think if Laporte didn't get injured, you know, we might not be having this discussion because it might be, you know, our defense would have been settled. But obviously, anyone can get injured at any time, so they should have yeah. taken that into consideration and got someone in just in case. Yeah, no, I do, I do like the fact that you know, we, we when we go out and we we buy players, we look at the, the squad overall, yeah. and we and we say to you know, where is this player going to fit into the squad? We're not just thinking you know, shirt sales and uh, individuals and who's the biggest name. 
And I'm so, so happy that we're not doing that. Because let's be honest, who'd heard of Rodri and Laporte before we bought them? Not many people in England, I would say, had heard of those guys. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. They, you know, they've turned out to be pretty decent players so far for us. So, uh, yeah. So, fingers crossed we don't go down the United route. I'm pretty sure we won't with the guys we've got in charge. And talking about United, let's move on and uh, discuss some of the other results from the weekend. Because there was a little result over at Old Trafford in the biggest derby that's ever happened in this <laughs> universe, apparently. Uh, it finished one all, and uh, Liverpool dropped points. So I'm quite happy with the result myself. What did you uh, make of that one, Chris? I missed the first 20 minutes of it, so uh, I don't know what it was like then. I thought it was a poor game. Uh, lacking in quality, a lot of sort of, you know, lumping it upfield. Um, disappointed United couldn't hold out, obviously, which is a, a weird thing to say. But, you know, at the minute, they're not our title rivals. You know, um, yeah, um, I'm glad that Liverpool didn't match our record of 18 straight. I think they have did 17. So that's another nice thing for, for them not to have done. Um, I thought they were a little unlucky with uh, Mane's goal. But, you know, it's about time something went against them because they've had a tremendous amount of luck. Yeah, I must admit, I did giggle to myself. I, I thought the the VAR decisions that have been going in Liverpool's favour this season and they go to Old Trafford and that's the one time you can guarantee where the you know the decisions might just go for yeah. the home side and yeah. uh, Liverpool didn't get the rub of the green. So I was uh, having a little giggle to myself. As that, as that game went by. What did you make of it, Yannicka? Did you manage to watch the game? Yeah, I did. Um, obviously, I'm happy with the result because it doesn't, you know, doesn't do United any favours. It definitely doesn't do Liverpool any favours. Um, I feel like now that the gap is six points, it's six points, right? Yes. I think now it's six points. It is solely in our hands now because if yeah. we beat Liverpool home and away, it's ours. So, there's, there can be no excuse now about you know us being eight points behind because now. Do you think we, we can beat six. Liverpool at Anfield, Janica? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, no, I do think we can. Of course, we can. Um, whether we will or not is a different thing. We can do it. We haven't done it in a long time, and to be honest, the last time we did it, we weren't the best. So maybe if we've not got the best squad this year, maybe we'll do it. Um, but I think last season we should have won there, hands down. We were the better team. You know, I know Mares missed the penalty, but I think we should have won that game way before that penalty came yeah, along. It's, so. it's going to be interesting, actually, because last year at Anfield, yeah. I found that we came up with this sort of plan B. And it's very unlike yeah. Pep to have a plan B, but we, we played a really solid defensive, sort of a, away from home in Europe type performance yeah. at Anfield. And we, and we nearly nicked it. Uh, and I think we have to do something similar. And yeah. sometimes when we're playing the Champions League, it frustrates the life out of me because we're so open and we don't have that plan B. So I'm hoping that if Pep has to, you know, he's sort of forced into using that plan B because of our injuries, yeah. then it might develop to something a little bit more because Pep is a little bit stubborn, I think, when it comes to that uh, plan B. But I think we can beat Liverpool away yeah. from we're definitely the better side, aren't we? Uh, you know, goes without saying. We are the champions. What do you think, Chris? Can we beat Liverpool at Anfield? Because that's that is the big one, isn't it? Yeah, of course it is. I think uh, we haven't got a good record there, have we? But uh, going going back to the United match today, Liverpool didn't control the game. I didn't think it at any point really. Um, when you watch City at Old Trafford last few seasons, you know we've dominated them. You know we are a better side than Liverpool are. We're just not getting the luck, uh, whether that's VAR or or injuries. You know, we 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 need it. I think we can beat them. And uh, I, like Yannicka says, now that the point's down to six again, I'm a little bit more confident. The, the problem is, you know, if if you took Van Dijk out of Liverpool, I don't think they'd be a solid. And that's exactly what we are without Laporte. Yeah, I mean, I, I found with Liverpool today. They they lost uh, Salah, didn't they? Salah was injured, so uh, yeah. Sal Salah didn't start the game. And Liverpool have had the settled eleven for so long 
that even just losing Salah, you could see the balance of the team was completely thrown out. I, th- yeah. I thought they just they, they almost turned into like Bournemouth today, bizarrely. You know, United had most of the play for for the first sort of hour of the game. And like you say, if somebody like Van Dijk or Mane, I think Mane is really important to them as well. If they were to miss them for any period of time, I really think they would struggle. I, re- I really do think they would struggle. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think Liverpool are as good as their fans think they are. Uh, I don't think they're a bad team either. I think they are the second best team in, in, the, in the country. I thought, I thought Dan James looked really good today. Uh, for United and Rashford had a decent match for a change. Yeah, uh, I just I, I felt a bit for United that they didn't win it. I think that's more me wanting them to take the three points. But um, like Yannick says, I'm not that bothered really. They both didn't get you know three points, so it's not a bad thing. Yeah, I think I think it was the depth in the squad that probably rescued Liverpool a point in that game. You know, yeah. they managed to bring on like Cater. Uh, I think they brought on Lalana. Obviously, you got the goal as well. Whereas United were struggling, they brought on a half-fit Martial. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy with the point. I did want I did want Liverpool to lose, but I never want United to win. So, yeah, it's one of those. So, uh, looking ahead, then we're we're playing Atlanta in the Champions League or At- Atalanta in the Champions League, not Atlanta. That's one of the teams in the MLS here where I live. Uh, what do you think the team lineup's going to be for for that game? Do you think Pep's going to go with the same team as he played against Crystal Palace, Yannicka? Uh I don't think Pep ever does the same thing. <laughs> I think he'll change it again. I think he'll bring Stones in because he did bring Stones on for a little bit. Um, so I think he might start Stones um, at the back. I don't really know with Pep because he's unpredictable. Um, I think he'll still play Gundogan, um, and I think he'll still play Fernandinho at the back. Hopefully, he doesn't start Asamendi and Stones together. Um, I'm not. I'm not too sure because we're at home. You know, I think we should really be winning. So I don't think, regardless of who he plays, I don't think there's really an excuse for us not to be winning. Um, but yeah, I'm not. I'm not too too sure who will play yet. He might bring Aguero back in if he's fit. Yeah, he seems to use Aguero as the go-to yeah. man in the Champions League. Uh, probably not a bad idea to bring Aguero back. I don't think Aguero is the kind of player that that will want to miss two games. No. On the bounce, uh, what what do you think, Chris? Do you think he's going to stick with that <laughs> uh, centre back pairing? I mean, I know it's a bit of a random question trying to predict a pet. Team. Exactly. You don't know what Pep's going to do, do you? No, who thought he'd play those two yesterday? You know, that's the last thing I thought that he'd do. But um, uh, I think Aguero will probably play. I have no idea. Who do. Atalanta are supposedly going to be the whipping boys in the group. I hope that doesn't come back to bite me on the arse. But um, it should be. I, I would love to see Foden get a game. I wouldn't mind seeing uh, one of the uh, young centre backs getting a go. Um, I think we've got enough to beat them with our second string, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think they lost uh, 4-0 to Zagreb, didn't they? Uh, I think they got hammered against Zagreb. So they can't be the greatest team in in the world. Yeah, and I just think, you know, at home, we should be way too strong for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Taylor Harwood bellis would be a good shout uh, to bring in as well. I, I, I absolutely love the fact we've got a local lad with yeah. as much passion as that kid's got. I mean, you saw him yeah. in the stand at Everton yeah. with the fans. I, I, haven't got a, I don't mind if it's him or Garcia, I think. Uh, this is my point. That last week, the, either of them can't be as bad as Otamendi's been. You know, give one of them a go. And if it's going to be in a Champions League game against Atalanta, then, you know, yeah, I, I, that works for me. Yeah, both of them uh, give a lot more mobility than Otamendi. But, in terms of physicality, that's the only thing that concerns me with Garcia, as opposed to T- Taylor Howard Bell. I think yeah. Howard Bell is a little yeah. bit bigger and a bit more bigger, physical. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's going to be interesting to see the team that they uh, that they pick and what and whatever Pep does. I'm sure it's going to leave us all scratching our heads. Uh, what we do. So uh, yeah, just to round up, then, guys. Uh, 
I just want to ask you about the Premier League and how it's going to pan out over the. And I'm I'm, I'm asking you to be Mystic Meg out of today. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's all like questions of what's going to happen. But I just want you to let me know what you think about the the title race. Obviously, the gap has now been reduced to six points between uh, City and Liverpool. Do you think we're going to get back in it, hand on heart? Do you think City are going to are going to win this title? That's what I'm asking you, I suppose, Chris. Oh, oh, oh. Um, oh this is so difficult. Uh, uh, my heart says uh, yes, and my head, not so much. Uh, I think we will miss Laporte, and you know, until he comes back, and even when he does come back, it's going to take a little while. Um, we've got the quality. To, to outscore most teams with a you know a makeshift back four, um, if, as long as we can stick our chances away, we can be a bit more clinical. Then we're right back in it. I am worried about going to Anfield with a makeshift back four, though. And uh, same question to you, Yannicka. Do you think uh, do you think we're going to do it? You know what? I think you can never rule City out of a title race. That is one thing. Um, also, it's, we're so far away from the end, you know. Um, if Liverpool, say Liverpool lose their next game and we win, it's three points. That's nothing, you know. Um, so I think, depending on how they do, if they go and win all their games now, then they deserve to win the league because they'd be unbeaten, you know, and they would deserve to do it. So I can't, if they do win it, then fair enough, you know. But I think I think we'll still at least take it to the end. I can't see us, you know, I can't see them running away with it. Um, One thing I will say is, I think you touched on it earlier, that they had not many injuries and now they've had, you know, their first one in Salah and it did change the way they played. So I think if they do get one injury to Van Dijk or, you know, um, Mane, I think they could struggle, and that's where we might see us overtake them. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, as long as we grind out or even just match their results at the moment, even if we match their results and we're still in it, then I think we've got every chance. But yeah, it, it does feel like that, doesn't it? It feels like it's a case yeah. of just hanging in there until yeah. we can get some of our players back and yeah. keep that gap at you know sort of six points at a maximum. I think we. See. Sorry, I think we are the best two teams in the in the league by some distance, you know, and with squad depth. And so, like you say, if you can match their results, you never know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Liverpool today, they were missing the two of the best players, really, because VAR was missing for them <laughs> and Mo Salah. So uh, hopefully if VAR can, you know, give them a few more decisions like today, then we might see a little bit more of a balance because I do think, I don't know. I know it sounds really bitter and sort of blue tinted, but I, I think you know they're probably five points further on than they should be this season due to decisions and just little things that have gone their way. So I don't think that the City boys should lose heart. I think we are the best team in the league, like you say. Yeah. We play the best football by a million miles, and uh, I think we just need to keep the faith. But it's not been a bad weekend at all. So I just want to say a huge thank you to you both for joining me today on this podcast. Uh, thank you to you, Yannicka. Uh, have you thank got anything you. to say before you, you leave? Anything, any parting words? And if you want to give us your social media, you can. Um, my Twitter is at Yannicka, Y-A-N-N-I-C-K, and then I think it's three A's. Um, that's all that I really have. I do have so Instagram, you- but I don't use it like that. Superb, um, and I would thank recommend. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, no, you are more than welcome, Yannicka, and I would recommend uh, following Yannicka because she is fantastic, uh, Blue, and it's always good to get that female opinion as well because uh, you know this is a male-dominated environment, and let's be honest, we're, we're boring, aren't we, us men? We're boring. Uh, Chris, <laughs> over to you, my friend. Uh, so, if you want to just give us your parting words, mate, and uh, give us your social media. Uh, I don't, social media and me aren't really uh, go hand in hand. Uh, just thanks for inviting us on, Kiam. Um, a message to Andy: get off Cancelo's back. Um, it, uh, you know, give, give him a chance. Uh, and apart from that, you know, everyone at Man City Fan TV, keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Chris. We will uh, we will start the campaign, mate, to get off Cancelo's back. We'll we'll sort Andy out, don't we? <laughs> 
<laughs> Don't you worry about that. Well, thank you very much, guys. I uh, really appreciate you joining us and uh, wish you all the very best and enjoy the rest of the season. Cheers. Take care. Thank Take you. care, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.